For those of us growing up reading Flying Magazine and a number of the publications of the time, it was the book of dreams. And for those of us who eventually mixed our flying with our writing and so forth, well, you kind of cobbed the dream job. It was, a, it was something that's been uh, uh, something I've wanted to do for a long time, Jim. And I also read, it, read Flying Magazine when I was a kid. I started out reading when I was a kid and just like you, dreamed about flying and dreamed about uh, someday doing some of this work. Uh, and I was very lucky in uh, the mid-70s to work as a stringer for Flying Magazine as a photographer. Um, I had a wonderful mentor by the name of Richard Collins and uh, he kind of mentored me into the writing world as well and, and you know the one thing led to another thing. Uh, it was easier for them because I had been in this business for a long time but also because I had a lot of experience to draw from and I think the combination was, uh, was kind of compelling for them. Well the one thing that, uh, that stands out in all this is that once again we've got somebody with a tremendous amount of experience finally getting called to do a job that he's qualified for and you just see, don't see that in politics you don't see that in the real world but thankfully in the aviation world the, the good guys tend to come out on top tell us a little bit about your background well I started flying when I was 11 years old with my father who uh, about that time decided to get a license uh, I became a line boy at that same airport when I was 15 and they had a wonderful deal with the FBO where the, uh, they allowed us to get a 50% discount on our flying lessons and I took every advantage of that that I could. So by the time I got to college I was a flight instructor with a, you know, a multi-engine rating and an instrument rating and uh, went through college as a flight instructor and became a charter pilot while I was there as well. Um, when I had 1200 hours, I think it was at the time, we uh, went out and did a 135 ride in an Aztec and off the races we went. Uh, after college, it was corporate flying, and uh, after that, it was airline. Airline started in the mid-80s. I just retired last fall with uh, 25 years of uh, big airplane experience, so that's quite a, quite a long time to hang around airports. Well, one of the things that impresses me about this is great heavy iron background, no question, but your heart's still in general aviation. Absolutely. I still have a J3 Cub at home with an 85 horse. I live in Colorado, which is about what you need a minimum engine for that airplane at that environment. Uh, we have 9,000 foot density altitudes on an average summer day, so an 85 horse Cub works pretty well with two people in it. I also have a 185 Skywagon. I live on an air park. Uh, I really never left the general aviation world when I went to the airlines and corporate as well. Uh, it's still where my heart is, and, uh, and I hope to bring that to the magazine as well. Integra Release 9 sets a new standard with the easiest to use pilot interface in all of general aviation. Access to any of Release 9's powerful capabilities is as simple as pressing the desired bi-directional page key. Pressing the same key in a desired direction navigates to the clearly labeled tabs with no more guessing as to what a given pilot input would do. Avidyne's Integra Release 9 is the next generation in fully integrated flight deck technology and the easiest to use page and tab user interface is just one of the many benefits designed to make your flying easier and safer. Well, let's face it, for the, the magazine business overall, the print magazine, paper magazine business, it's been tough. It's, it's vicious. I spent decades in there, got out of it about 11 years ago, and I, and I have to be honest, I don't miss that part of it at all. But you're taking, uh, you know, an uh, iconic publication and taking it over in the stead of some folks who, frankly, have had some pretty big shoes. A little scared? It's, it is daunting, and, and I'm sure uh, when we look back and see some of the amazing writers, uh, the people we connected with as we were reading the magazine years ago, it's, it's daunting to think that we could uh, even have any uh, resemblance to those writers. Uh, but that's the bar we have to go for. That's the thing that we have to shoot for. And uh, I'm a continuous improvement kind of guy, and I want to improve the magazine with each issue. And that's a challenge because you're, you're aware of that. You work that every day yourself. Um, to, uh, to, but to stand on those shoulders and improve the magazine, I think, is a, is a pretty cool thing. Indeed. What might we expect from a flying magazine under the helm of Michael Maya Charles? Well, we've had that question a lot at the show and, uh, and prior to as well. I think, uh, again, we're not going to do a major overhaul. The engine's not going to come off the, the mount, and we're not going to split the case and pull the jugs off. Uh, what we are going to do is take what we do well, which is pilot reports and product reports and how to and learn to fly and try to improve it all. Mm -hmm. uh, since I come from the visual side of the house, it'll have better visuals, I hope. Uh, we're going to spend more attention, more uh, resources on that. Uh, we're also going to uh, pay more attention to the web. Uh, there's still a, a need for the paper magazine and probably will be for some years to come, even though some people have predicted its demise. And I think that the magazine uh, also represents well uh, with the digital side. Now, another moment of freedom from Sirius Aircraft. Freedom through safety. Perhaps the ultimate freedom is confidence, assurance, and peace of mind. We design it into every personal aircraft we build. 
It's the security that comes with knowing you're flying the plane with a parachute. The breakthrough concept that launched the Cirrus phenomenon. This industry has had, let's say, not the best decade we've ever had. There's been some problems out there, both with the perception of aviation as well as how aviation represents itself to the world. Uh, for folks like you and I, we're trying to put our best foot forward every single day, and it's getting tougher, especially after slams yesterday like USA Today and things of that nature, people who don't understand. How can we, as the folks who are within aviation, better represent this industry to the world? How can we change our image? Well, I think one of the things we need to do, Jim, is we need to be more uh, welcoming of people into our midst. Uh, we have a tendency to not do that very well. We want to be uh, thought of as being the macho studly aviators instead of people that welcome you to our midst. And uh, we also need to be do better outreach programs. We need to reach out into the communities, not just the people that are flying now, but people that haven't flown, uh, the people that are thinking about it, the kids like you and I were when we were coming up reading Flying Magazine. I want to reach out to those people as well. And I want them to feel like this would be a cool thing to do. Uh, when I read some of the other special interest magazines and I put the magazine down, I think, I'd like to go skiing or I'd like to go boating. And I want people to have that same experience and I'm sure you, you work the same uh, angle with your own uh, site, your own news site, where you're trying to get people in and say, this is a cool, fun thing to do. Not, this is an exclusive club and you've got to have type ratings or 25,000 hours to get in. So, Are there any aspects of aviation that deserve more coverage in flying? I mean, the obvious, the obvious question when we're talking about bringing new people in, are we going to see more LSAs, for instance, in flying? I think you'll see more of the lighter end stuff. What we're trying to do is continually work that balance. Mm -hmm. Uh, with a title name like flying, you can't do just jets and you can't do just LSAs and you can't do, do just uh, helicopters. You've got to really reach for all the directions. We try to do that over a period of time because let's face it, you can't do that in every issue. There's just not enough pages. So what we're trying to do is find that balance over a period of time so that most people that read the magazine will get something that they want. Because let's face it, it's about with them. It's what's in it for me. If they read the piece and there's nothing in it, they're going to go on and you know, probably put the magazine down. Again, that's one of the, the most difficult challenges that I face as editor of this magazine, is to find all of those venues, if you will, or all those types and say, here's a piece that you might enjoy. And try to do that on a basis of several months to where everybody kind of gets a good feel for somebody delivering content to them. Well, I'm going to do something I rarely do with anybody from the Dirty, Filthy, Nasty competition, and I'm going to wish you the best of luck, both from the work I've seen you do in the past, the work I know you can do, and the, I know the heart you bring with it. Good luck to you, Michael. Thanks, Jim. I really appreciate that.